Welcome to the Friday edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 690. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is October 8th, 2021. All right, welcome to another program of Anglican Unscripted, the Friday edition. Now, it's Friday, and I'm in a campground. There's going to be some noise outside Monstro here that I cannot control. Right now, the guy behind me, he's packing up his trailer, and uh, you'll probably see stuff in the, in the curtain behind me as they're trying to do what they need to do to get pack up and, and move on uh, to wherever they're going. Jill and I are staying here in the Mammoth Cave area. People keep asking, Kevin, where are you? Let me pull it up quickly on the map. And we are, I'm not gonna give you the exact location, but this is Kentucky. See that blue dot? We are in Kentucky. And if I zoom in here, we are, there's Bowling Green. There is Mammoth Cave. And that's where we're gonna go visit this afternoon and tomorrow and take the tour of the cave. But, uh, uh, lots of people seem to like Mammoth Cave and lots of people who have loud trucks <laughs> like Mammoth Cave. But we'll get through this. Don't worry about it. George, how you been doing? Just wonderful. Actually, wonderful and awful. Uh, it's been a very busy week at the parish, getting ready for the fall season, the start of Christian education. And, and we had uh, some very difficult deaths uh, this week. We had a suicide and we had... Uh, someone dying from after battling kidney failure and these were all very emotional very difficult uh, deaths of people well known well loved in the community and in the church but it's a part of life of uh, birth and death previous weekend we had marriages and baptisms this weekend we had deaths so uh, it, it goes back and forth, but it's all part of the wonder and joy of being a parish priest. You get to be in the people's lives right at the most important points, and you're able to be there and help share the love and power and peace of God in joy and in sadness. It's a wonderful way to be. Yeah, and that's, that's the truth of church. The church isn't just there for the bad times. Church isn't just there for the good times church is actually there to allow us a great avenue to worship God and to be in fellowship with one another and sometimes we kind of just miss all that oh I'm just going to go to church for Christmas and for Easter and maybe if grandma's coming Thanksgiving we'll go for this Thanksgiving weekend and church is always has always been and will always be so much more than that George what I was surprised uh, in dealing with the effects after the suicide, um, it was a gunshot, a self-inflicted gunshot, um, person with the family and everything in, that, in their home, family home. What pleasantly surprised me was that I've only had to do about 5% of the ministry. Members of the congregation, friends and fellow parishioners, neighbors who are part of our church, have stepped up and spontaneously offered pastoral support, spiritual support. They're being, they're doing it right. And I almost feel superfluous. I don't know how that, that sounds so selfish of me, I'm sorry, but it's really a church that's working because they are a community uh, of brothers and sisters in Christ. At, and they're there when the bad times happen and the good times happen and it's a joy to be part of such a wonderful place yeah i remember a influential priest in my life and this goes back to the 90s he said my job here as your priest is to work myself out of a job to raise up mm -hmm. the laity raise up the deacons raise up um, everybody who is part of this church body to perform at every level and I'm like, oh, yeah, right, that's not going to work. And he, he did a great job. The church was always there to step in, in the good times and in the bad times. You know, the, the bake sale had the best sugary <laughs> uh, items you could ever have. Uh, when there was a tragedy, the church was stepping up and taking uh, its role in all these different forms. Uh, we had a, a, a horrible tragedy where uh, a uh, the 
she was a nun uh, at the church, died in a horrible car accident and uh, on a bridge. And the, the whole church suffered, grieved horribly, but they all stepped up. And this new rector at the time uh, had very little to do in this because the church took the and, and stepped into that gap because that's how they were trained to do it. Emotionally, that's very frightening for me because I, I guess I want to control things or be in charge or seem to be doing stuff. But logically and spiritually, I know this is the way God wants it to be, where it's the community that ministers and I help lead the community, not me doing all the ministry and everybody else just sitting around waiting for me to act. So it's, I'm learning, even after 25 years, I keep learning the lessons I've been taught and they were true and they are true. All right, well, let's get on with the program. If you have not liked the show yet, you're you're already a couple minutes in. Click that like button on Facebook or YouTube. It's got the thumb. You can't miss it. Even if you don't like the program, just click it because it keeps advertising. It's a free way for us to advertise. We have a podcast. If you just don't want to see two men talk about church news all day long, you can listen to us. We got great voices. We know what we're doing here. If you have a comment and you say, you know, George, you're mispronouncing a diocese really badly or you've misidentified it well there's we go you go in the comments and said you meant this not that and uh or correct us or enhance our stories or add your opinion please do that in the comment section if you have not subscribed yet to anglican unscripted go to our facebook link and there's a little red rectangle you click subscribe and up pops a little bell the bell if you click that gives you instant notifications whenever i upload a show which we try to do every tuesday and friday there's a little background noise here because people move it out so if it gets loud i'll turn my mic off and i'll look at george and he can pick up the conversation it's friday at a campground george good news stories uh first i want to talk about is there's now a vaccine for malaria what took so long? What, you know, it's just like you and I, every time we would travel to uh, Africa, we'd have to go to our, our, our doctor. We actually had a uh, uh, infectious disease clinic in Watertown. I would go to, and the lady there would say, well, give me your yellow card. And I hold up my yellow card. And she says, what, where are you going? I'm going to go to uh, Uganda. Oh, you need this, 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 and this. And she'd give me three or four shots here, there, and there. I go, well, what about malaria? Well, we don't have a vaccine for malaria. I have a yellow pill that you have to take uh, when you're in Africa for malaria. I said, okay, fine. George, we no longer have to take the yellow pill, but thousands, if not over time, millions of people will now be saved from the, the devastation of just getting malaria. But children under 10 suffer greatly and, and have a high mortality rate. This will end that. Oh, but the... The discovery of a vaccine against malaria, I don't know where it stands scientifically as to whether it's a once and done or if it's an annual. I don't know where those things stand. And I don't know how much it will cost, whether this will be prohibitively expensive for the developing world, be some like the AIDS, uh, early AIDS drugs were. But if this is true and if this can be distributed where it's needed, this will make a tremendous change in the quality of life of people in the developing world. Um, it's one, it would be a paradigm shift uh, akin to what we saw here in Florida in the 30s when they introduced air conditioning. Before the 1930s, Florida, unless you were a good old boy farmer or cracker as they called him, uh, it was not really livable for three or four months of the year with the, the heat and the mosquitoes and the humidity certainly in the interior portions. Then air conditioning came along and we went from 30 million, 3 million to 30 million people. Uh, well, we I, I think Walt, some... Walt Disney helped a little bit with that as well. But, you know, it, it, it is True. amazing the technology but... that brought in the ability to, exi to have a good existence in places like Florida, Texas, and Arizona. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you I mean you couldn't live in large parts of Texas and or Arizona because of the humid heat without air conditioning. 
There are parts of Africa that are underpopulated, have wonderful natural resources, but people can't really live there because of the deleterious effects of mosquitoes and the malaria. And if this has been overcome, God be praised. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, it, we don't know, once again, and this is the great vaccine debate, obviously. You know, people who, oh, I'm not going to get vaccinated for COVID, are all in favor of a malaria vaccination and making it mandatory for those who live in a place where malaria is, in certain part, portions of this world, much more deadly than COVID, and especially well, for I, the younger population. Well, I think the difference is uh, hesitancy for a COVID vaccine in the United States, and I can only speak to my experiences with that. I'm not vaccinated. I encourage others to be vaccinated. But a large part of our African-American community is not vaccinated, and they don't trust the government. And the whole vaccine issue of COVID has been politicized. If you remember during the campaign for president, Kamala Harris famously said she would not take a vaccine put out by the Trump administration because she didn't trust them. Well, she won, and she and her boss, Joe Biden, are saying you must now take these vaccines. And they're wondering why people don't trust them. Well, it's all part of politics. Mm -hmm. um, it's just one of the, probably, the great news story of the decade, if it's true. So we shall see. Yeah, well, yeah I mean, you get the first reports. Vaccine for malaria. Yay. Well, vaccine for malaria, how often do I have to take this vaccine? You know, I, like we said, smallpox, that's, that's a one and done. They, they have a, a certain vaccine there that builds up the antibodies forever in your body. We know with COVID that they're unsure of how long uh, COVID will remain in effect in your body. Uh, every day there's a different report with COVID. Some, you know, this will last for years. This will keep you out of the hospital. This will last for weeks. You know, the CDC is, is constantly putting out different information about COVID. And that's leading a little bit to distrust here in, in America, in the West, as to whether or not people should get the vaccine, George. Well, COVID, I think, is a unique circumstance of a politicized medical decision. If you can remember back to the election campaign, Kamala Harris and Joe Biden were quite vocal in saying that they would not trust a vaccine coming out of the Trump administration because it hadn't been tested thoroughly, it had not gone through all the uh, double-blind random tests, and this was, and they were worried that the vaccine approved by the Trump Food and Drug Administration would be uh, a political stunt. Well, now that they're president and vice president and they're calling for Americans all to be vaccinated, they don't seem to understand that the political distrust that they had two years ago, a year and a half ago, is shared by many on the other side of the spectrum. And here, here's the kicker. Um, the majority of whites are vaccinated at this time. It's the African-American uh, community in particular that is not vaccinated. So one of the knock-on effects of these laws, like in New York City, that requires you to have a vaccine passport to enter a restaurant or a theater, is that you're introducing a form of uh, segregation or Jim Crow laws. Because uh, eight out of 10 blacks in New York, I think is the latest statistic I saw, are not vaccinated. And so in essence, you're closing them to, closing them out of restaurants mm -hmm. and uh, social life. And the reason why African Americans are not taking vaccines is partially due to a lack of trust in the government. They don't necessarily trust uh, the government in Washington will be actually looking out for their affairs. Uh, do you remember when Jesse Jackson was spreading the, the story that uh, AIDS was created by the CIA sure. to kill off black people? Yeah. Now, the, the uh, KGB got, uh, was actually revealed after the fall of the communism to be peddling that story as disinformation in the third world, that this was a CIA plot to kill off minorities. But unfortunately, many societies began to believe these things, and the tendency to believe in conspiracy theories uh, 
has not been helped by the politicization of the COVID crisis. Well, let me give you here an example of talking about trust in government. Uh, Jill and I are uh, currently outside of uh, Mammoth Cave this week camping, and we're going to go visit Mammoth Cave later today after I uh, finish editing the show. And if you look here, we're up in the Kentucky area, and you, you zoom down here, and this is Mammoth Cave. It's a national park within uh, the United States, and uh, millions of people come here, and they go into the largest cave in the world, Mammoth Cave. Mammoth Cave was not always a national park. Uh, back in the uh, 1700s, 1800s, this was settled by people who came over uh, on boat, and they said, I'm going to be a farmer. They grabbed up the land around here with the little land certificates that were given out by the government, and they bought acres of land for uh, on the cheap, very inexpensive, and they started setting up farmland. They cut down the trees uh, around the, the Mammoth Cave area, and they became farmers, and they would hire sharecroppers. And there were a, a large community of about 600 people in, in the Mammoth Cave Park area with uh, the sharecroppers who would help tend the fields, plant the crop, tend the crop, and take the crop out at the end of the year. Kentucky said, listen, we have this wonderful, you know, extravaganza called the Mammoth Cave. We want to buy up the land and donate it to the national government so that the U.S. can have this as a national park system. The only way you can do that is to kick out the residents. And so they made a deal where they would buy up your property at the, the, the going rate. And whether or not you liked it, you had to leave. And that's called eminent, eminent domains. That's a law we have here in, in the U.S. where the government can force you to leave. Well, that's great, except they did this in the Depression in the 1920s. And they took a whole community of people who were farmers and they moved them to a, a city just down the road called Cave City and said, you're going to have to find work here. You're going to have to uh, set up your lives here and start businesses and do what you want to do here. And they also took the hundreds of sharecroppers and displaced them who had no place to work. And there is to this day generations of people in Kentucky who do not trust the government for starting the, the national park system with Mammoth Cave because of the Emmett domain. You're from uh, Pennsylvania. When the interstate system went through there, they uh, bought up all this land and displaced uh, farmers and uh, people in the, in the suburbs and said, we're gonna put an interstate here and that was that was horrible to Pennsylvania. They, they they distrust their government. No government should be able to do this. Well, ouch. Well, it, it it's actually I hate to say this because it makes me sound cynical, but it's who you know. Yes, My it, grandfather had right. a very good friend who uh, was a uh, who he had a horse farm that the U.S. government wanted to buy. It happened to be in a place called Valley Forge, and they essentially. He made a fortune selling his land to the government to start Valley Forge Park because what he would do is he bought up all the all small farmers around him and then when the government finally came to condemn the land for to create the park, they only had one or two owners mm -hmm. to deal with and he was able to basically make a killing because of advanced information and uh, knowing people in the process. Yeah. So we went out to Rocky the eminent Mountain. domain makes some people very wealthy. <laughs> it does. And it hurts other people. Uh, when we went to Rocky Mountain uh, National Park out in uh, uh, the Colorado area, uh, there were people there who had made deals that the government will give you our place for free if you let us live here till we die. And so, you know, there's different deals made everywhere with em eminent domain. And so um, we're talking about mistrust but the, the poor government. always yeah. get the poor see the, the poor, poor seem to get shafted yes, more times do. than not. Absolutely. No no question about it. Um, other good news? How did that that vaccine story went from good news to bad news? The good news is there's a vaccine for malaria. Bad news is people don't trust the government. Well, that may be good news. Never fully trust your government. George Catherine Jeffert Shorey is in the news again. She is really part of our fame. Uh, was reporting on her as presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church and some of the things that she did as the presiding bishop. Uh, certainly the formation of the ACNA occurred under her uh, tutelage and watch. 
And so it's nice to see that she's back in the news. What is the story here, George? Well, Catherine Jefford Shore is responsible for our greatest ever day on uh, Google uh, rankings. When back in the day when the Drudge Report meant something, when Drudge picked up our story about uh, G Catherine Jefford Shore saying that Paul had no business casting out the demon that possessed the slave girl in Ephesus because she was an autonomous person and he was just a man forcing him on herself. Yeah. Catherine Jefferson Shore was the gift that kept on giving. She was Miss Malaprop. She would just say the wrong things at the wrong time. And she wasn't particularly good at her job. And so she just gave us fodder for mm -hmm. story after story after story that uh, just sort of, it was our breakout, really. We, uh, we owe her a lot. We, we owe her a lot. We, we owe, do. We owe the leadership of the Episcopal Church who... Uh, said this is our new leader we we owe some conservative bishops who voted for her uh you know it, it, it was a, a definite time of transition with the church where we're going from a blogging atmosphere of protest within the church to a more of a news reporting atmosphere in the church and anglican inc and anglican scripture we're not blogging or vlogging this this is news we're sitting here trying to get it the story as correct as we can yes we give our bias to it but we want to be accurate in the end. And in that in that transition time from blogging to where we are now, Catherine Jefferson Shorey was just there at a time when the whole church was trying to figure out what is the Episcopal Church doing? What is its future? This is the time when uh, the the archbishops and from Africa were putting out the press releases all the time saying, stop doing what you're doing. You're, you're causing a, a tear in the fabric. Those times are gone, George. Well, that hopefully we may have an uptick because Catherine Jefferson Shorey is going back to work. She's going to be an assistant bishop in the Diocese of Los Angeles, along with two other retired bishops. Uh, Los Angeles has uh, lost its assistant bishop to another place, and Catherine Jefferson Shorey will be returning to work. Mm -hmm. Now, well, I'm just excited, expecting that the next publication of her latest sermon or her latest pronouncement, uh, she just can't, I uh, mean, she just can't keep away from the microphone. And uh, Los Angeles right now, Los Angeles, the city of Los Angeles has one of the strictest COVID lockdown mandates. And I know she's going to get involved. I just have a sense in my being okay. that she's going to get involved in that fight. Um, and it's just, it's just, uh, Okay, well, George and I... Wonderful for reporters. Yeah, please, Catherine Jefford, Shorty, get involved in this. Put out your opinions on uh, the vaccine. And uh, why don't you follow the cathedral in San Francisco, which uh, mandates that you have to show your vaccine card before you uh, come into the cathedral. So, Or she'll get involved in the uh, illegal, uh, the border problem with all these people swarming over the border from Mexico. Yeah. Uh, she just has a just a golden knack for finding the right, being at the right place in the right time for reporters. Amen. All right. Uh, good news out of the ACNA. There is a new book series called Knowing Anglicanism. I didn't get a chance to read up very much on the story. You know what's going on. Uh, this is a another shining star for the ACNA. Yes. Uh, Anglican House Publishing, which is the press imprint affiliated with the Anglican Church in North America, has started a series on the Anglican way, the Anglican faith. And I think this could be as important as the publication of the ACNA's own prayer book, the, the Book of Common Prayer. Because you've got the first series of five books, you've got five stellar, really top flight uh, thinkers, writers, academics, speaking about Anglican, and I'll just read you some of the titles. Marriage According to the Book of Common Prayer by Professor Stephen Knoll, who's been a guest on this show. Yeah, absolutely, that'd be a good book. East, Easter Tide, the season beginning with Easter Sunday by Ashley Knoll, the world's greatest authority on Thomas Cranmer, Cranmer and you yeah. walk through the you walk through the uh, Easter season with Thomas Cranmer and Ashley Knoll. Ray Sutton, uh, presiding Bishop of the REC uh, on these holy mysteries, uh, looking at the sacraments. 
and Arnie Klukas, a friend of ours, a mm -hmm. former professor at Neshota House, parsing the prayer book. Um, and then the first book that will be coming out is by John Rogers, former dean of Trinity Seminary, Faith of the Anglicans, it's teaching of each of the 39 oracles of religion. These books could be for the Anglican Church in North America, uh, what the homilies were for the Church of England at the time of the Reformation. Now, why am I saying this? The ACNA started out in its first year or two as we're not the Episcopal Church. We're the church that's not the Episcopal Church. And it has grown from there into its own understanding, into its own ethos, into its own way. And these serious scholars will be laying down the tracks for the Anglican Church in North America as more than a protest movement, but as a bona fide expression of the Anglican way in North America. Uh, not just uh, in terms of that we're here, but rather we're here and we have a lasting purpose and impression, and these help express that. Yeah. So I I'm think, excited. No, I am too. The, the Jerusalem Declaration said, this is, you know, this is our foundation, this is what we believe as a church as a whole. Uh, they certainly include the creeds, the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. It's a very creedal church. It's a liturgical church. Now they're identifying their ethos, something that's completely uh, going to separate them from what you look at and say, what is the Anglican communion? We are this part of the Anglican communion. This is where we identify within the Anglican communion. This is how we hope to identify the Anglican communion in the future. And so, yeah, I, I'm excited by it. Uh, I will certainly uh, be buying these books and uh, hopefully get to interview the authors as, as the books come out. So. Um, good job. Knowing Anglicanism is, is the book, and I will try to link in the show notes uh, the article on Anglican.inc. Um, next story I have here is the Episcopal Church released their numbers uh, for 2019-2020. Uh, part of these are COVID numbers. Uh, they talk about the ASA, which is the, um, uh, oh my gosh, brain died average which is sunday a, attendance every sunday attendance that uh, people report you always see like the a vesti person going back and write down how many people are in the uh, counting forward from the back of the church attended that's the asa and they they do an average uh for the year who attended when and the episcopal church the asa on it's not unexpected that in COVID times they would have lost an average sunday attendance all churches did I think what's unexpected is the amount of, and I think we should talk about that, George. Yes. Uh, uh, if you really want to do a deep dive in the numbers, go to Anglican Inc., where we published the source material, and Jeff Walton of, of the IRD has a really good article summarizing all this information. But the membership of the Episcopal Church fell 4% uh, to about 1.57 million. But more importantly, ASA dropped 12% and is now below 500,000. It was 458,000 in 2020. Now the numbers were basically only the period January 1st to March 1st, because the COVID lockdowns began beginning of March. And we need to say that the Luth ELCA <clears throat> and the United Methodist Church have posted similar declines. But what is surprising for the Episcopal Church is that its finances were hit. The plate in pledge dropped $59 million from $1.35 billion to $1.29 billion. No, billion. Billion. The And in 2020, the inflation rate was pretty low. Um, so that it's surprising the Episcopal Church has never really taken a tremendous financial hit. Uh, now, this is not a tremendous financial hit, but uh, it is significant nonetheless. Um, and if you look at the diocesan numbers, uh, some dioceses just were blown away. I mean, I don't know what happened in them, whether they had squirrely way of counting or whether the people really were staying out 
but uh, some dioceses were tremendously impacted, losing a quarter of their member, quarter of their attendance um, in 2020. Yeah. Now, again, it was a COVID year. It was COVID, but and, I saw, you know, in talking to Jeff through email, he said some of these numbers were representative of the pre-COVID. COVID really hit in March. March is when the churches were shut down. And these numbers don't reflect Easter, which was pretty much canceled in the Episcopal Church and all churches, and uh, other holidays when uh, people really attend. So, you know, I, I don't know. We'll have to see what straightens out in 2021. <sighs> But, well, weddings for some some of the pe pastoral services, mm -hmm. weddings down forty six percent, children's baptisms down sixty seven percent, adult baptisms down fifty seven percent. Those are just frightening numbers. Um, my diocese, I believe, Central Florida had a double digit decline in average Sunday attendance, which to me was frightening and surprising at the same time. Um, my parish was an outlier. We were hit in that our income fell 28%. We had 306,000 in 2019, but only 219, 220 in 2020. But at the same time, as our attendance dec income declined 28 percent our attendance rose 22 percent so we 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 finally wound up at 277 um adding uh 40 50 people over the year um so i don't really know what's happening in the wider diocese because it really wasn't reflected here now when the lockdown began everything stopped yeah and tw and I'm going to see a tremendous drop in the 2021 numbers because you and I live in the oldest counties. Uh, I live in the fourth oldest county in the United States. Oh, and I don't yeah. mean it's because the Spanish came first, but age of people. Yeah, that's right. And you live in the third oldest county because of age of people. Mm -hmm. And older people are not flocking back to church like young people with children. So... I still am missing a hundred bodies, so I'm off uh, from the 277 number. I'm all missing a hundred people, so I'm going to look terrible next year for the numbers. But we'll see how the year ends with people coming. But I just don't understand what's pushing these numbers this hard and this fast. Because not only the crazy dioceses are take tanking, but good dioceses, it's Dallas and Central Florida. And Tennessee and whatnot are seeing declines. I well, just don't have a sense of where that could be coming from. What do we, you think? Of? Well, we've discussed many times that the church was not prepared for a pandemic uh, in mm -hmm. any way, shape, or form. And I think the numbers here are reflective of that. The numbers are reflected from a church that uh, went from attending in person to attending online, um, uh, you know, kind of that, that virtualness. And uh, when do people start returning? And you've discussed this with your church. They're just, they're not coming back to the point where George is not, where George is comfortable. You, you, you want to get back to the 2019 number. And that 2019 number for all churches is five years away because people are, are coming out of this um, in a new normal. And we've discussed this before. The new normal is I get to work remotely. I, I mean, I've taken it to the extreme, but everybody gets to work remotely. Uh, except for retail and some other uh, types of jobs. And uh, in doing this new normal, I attend church differently. I'm fully active in my church back in Connecticut, but Jill and I visit churches in part of our travels, and we enjoy that and being part of the fellowship that happens around the nation in the ANCA churches. ACNA churches, sorry. I've had not all, I have not had all my coffee yet. And so in, in doing that, Everything is different. COVID changed everything, George. And the numbers are here. And one of the things I've noticed as I've sort of sat back and tried to digest these numbers and internalize them for my own purposes is, as I look back at this year of 2021, my efforts have been in bringing back the people I had. And the efforts that I used to put in to reaching the unchurched have essentially stopped. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to turn away people 
but I'm not having that focus on reaching people who don't know Christ. I'm just, in essence, trying to bail out the water in my boat. Well, and you're being in an older community, you're regathering being the sheep. in an older community, I'm, st uh, I'm still going to have the natural attrition of death. Yeah. Of, uh, so, I mean, I can think of a buried 20, 25 people. Um, and, you know, when somebody dies, if it's a couple, husband dies, uh, wife moves into a nursing home up north to be near her children. Mm -hmm. um, that That's a multiple, that's a knock-on number. So I'm working to, but I put my efforts into re, re, re reaching out to those who should be here and have been remiss in reaching out to those who need to hear the gospel for the first time, perhaps. Yeah. And I think many churches are making that error. And well, I'm assuming that many churches are making that error and not doing the work of uh, of uh, go out and make disciples among all nations. Yeah, it's one of the things that COVID has changed. You know, the the nature, structure, and the purpose of the church. Uh, I, I, it was nice to see the 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 purpose of the church to become, you know, very fellowship orientated, very church orientated to be, you know, to who's not here, who needs help. We, you know, the first couple of months of COVID, we were calling all the people, making sure they had the food they need because they were afraid to go shopping. And we'd make sure that uh, all their meads were made because they didn't want to go to the doctor. And, you know, uh, that's what the pandemic allowed our church to do is reconnect with all the needs of the current parishioners. And yeah, we lost a little focus on uh, the greater community, but now we're back into the greater community again. And um, what, well, once again, we'll just have to observe and see what happens and uh, pray that we continue to glorify God in this and that we encourage the believers and we continue our fellowship and the church will survive. It has to. Well, yeah. we're seeing some steps now. The, di uh, the three dioceses in Wisconsin, your stomping ground, uh -huh. uh, Milwaukee, Fond du Lac, and Eau Claire are discussing uh, juncture is the church word for merger. Mm -hmm. uh, Milwaukee's the big boy. It's got about uh, 2,500 people average on a Sunday. Fond du Lac about 1,300 and Eau Claire only about 350. And they're going to merge those together. They're talking about merging those together to uh, basically make one functioning diocese with you know, an ASA of about four or 5,000, which hopefully will enable it to be, go forward as an ongoing entity. Um, but that's a smart thing to do. Uh, because yeah, Eau Claire, uh, Eau Claire with only 357 people on a Sunday, which was their 2020 average Sunday attendance. Mm -hmm. That's church. A lot there. No, that's not church. Well, that they should probably think about adding Northern Michigan, which has only what was that number? Uh, 230. My parish has a greater average Sunday attendance than the diocese of Northern Michigan. How are these entities able to survive? Well, they're not going to be able to because yeah. there's no money coming from New York to prop them up. So they've got to find ways to support the overhead of the church. So mergers, um, dissolution, uh, it's a difficult time. It is. Now, and I don't want to say, oh, this is just how horrible the Episcopal Church is. All churches are going to be reporting some bad numbers. Even the ACNA and other Orthodox churches are going to have COVID numbers uh, in their numbers. I was just surprised how drastic these numbers were for the Episcopal Church. Um, what what What's funny, Kevin, to talk about my little patch, yeah. my finances are back where they were. It's my, so in other words, I had a huge swing down in 2020 now I'm going to have a huge swing back up in 2021, and I'm going to see the reverse in the attendance. Yeah. So I am, of course, I worry, but because people are still sending in their checks, and uh, that sounds awful, but they're still sending in their checks even if they're not coming. No. So I know I, I interpret that to mean they do want to come back when they feel safe. They they do want to be participants in the body, and they're they're expressing themselves as safe as they can in COVID times. And we still are in COVID times. 
Um, it doesn't take too long to watch the national news to figure out that they don't want to give up on this COVID times at all. Uh, we got some other stories. We've gone really long with just our, our, our good news and introductory story. Uh, we're already at 40 some minutes in here. Let's talk quickly about um, uh, what they're going to do over in England. Uh, it's called Leicester Diocese. We, we, you, you wanted to completely identify it as a different diocese last time. Leicester Diocese is going to go from 234 churches down to 20 or 30 ministry churches and explain how that's going to work. I apologize for confusing Leicester and Worcester. I'm sorry. sorry. I, a brain fog. Uh, tomorrow, Saturday, October 9th, the Diocese of Leicester, his Senate is going to debate changing its structure from 234 parishes to 20 to 25 minster churches. These minster churches, in essence, would be regional churches that would have forced paid staffers, uh, both clergy and lay. And these then, the, the, they then would be responsible for 10 to 15 of these former parishes akin to a Methodist circuit rider. Um, now, the, this plan is predicated on lay people stepping up and being more active in the life of the church, providing more pastoral care, and having, in essence, the priest just be a visiting priest and Eucharistic celebrant, and for all intents and purposes, devolving pastoral care and support uh, to lay people or to maybe non stipendary deacons and stuff like that. The uh, the impetus is costs. They, the diocese wants to cut the number of paid clergy by about 20 to 25 percent. They want to add additional administrative staff to manage these, these minster churches. And the commentary that we're getting from England is this is an appalling idea, liberals and conservatives say, because it's destroying the parish system that by super centralizing uh, everything and having the priest just be a uh, a tenor preacher who dispenses communion as if he were a vending truck or a food truck, um, you're breaking the whole link of people with their parish. Things are bad, but this will only make things worse is the argument we're hearing. Yeah. Well, no, and I remember reading some early history about uh, the Episcopal Church within you know, the United States here, that many parishes, uh, especially in the East Coast, uh, were, would have morning prayer on Sunday, not the Eucharist. Once a month they would have the Eucharist. And you know that, that dynamic change where we're going to have the Eucharistic right one or two every Sunday, uh, we will have less of a traveling uh, priest situation, and the church has gone through many dynamics over the years. This, like you said, is kind of the, the Methodist uh, mantra of traveling priest here from what I can see. Well, I don't want to knock, I don't want to be heard knocking the Methodists by any no. Uh, no, means, no. but rather I'm saying that the Church of England is uh, plagued by a lack of enthusiasm from its lay people, partially because its clergy don't do a good job. And they're just choosing the worst possible solution, I think. They're, they're playing to this church's, the church's weaknesses are it's over bureaucrat, over bureaucratic, overly centralized, too many uh, drones and middle management, and they're going to add middle management, get rid of the actual people who do the job of ministry, and then say that oh yeah well the lay people will pick up the slack it's not going to happen yeah. i just i just can't see this working um now there are also legal issues involved because these parishes are freestanding institutions that have their own uh that appoint patrons and livings and things like that and uh, the parish councils have some authority does the church of england really want to strip the parish councils of all their authority and get rid of the way they've done things for 1500 years i don't know if it's such no. a good idea no uh next story really quickly uh this this goes to the bureaucracy that we just talked about uh stephen kurt 
uh, who initially complained about a uh, clergy person who was sexually impietist, big word there, uh, and was turned down at the diocesan level, at the leadership level. They didn't want to investigate this person. He took it to the authorities. And I may have the story wrong. I didn't read the whole article. Well, well, give me the Stephen Kurtz. Uh, uh, Earlier story. this year, reported yeah. we reported about the Reverend Stephen Kirk, vicar mm -hmm. of Christ Church New Malden, which is in the Diocese of Southwark. Uh, Mr. Kurt reported that there was a lay person in the diocese who lay person. appeared to That's was, what I got wrong. who was uh, violating safeguard norms, mm -hmm. and he reported this to the diocese. The diocese basically took no action. Mm -hmm. And then he went to the national church safeguarding, and they took no action. He went to the police. The police arrested the guy, and the guy had a criminal con and was criminally convicted for abuse. So Kurt was right in doing all this. Kurt tried to get action out of the diocese and the national church, and he was ignored. He then spoke to some people about this issue. Among them, Andrew Greystone, the fellow who just wrote the book about the uh, Church of England abuse and the. Uh, John Smythe uh, affair, mm -hmm. and then the diocese took action and suspended Kurt for talking about this in public to strangers. And Kurt was suspended for almost six months. Well, his parish stood behind him and raised a stink, including sending press releases to Anglican Inc. We talked about this, and the diocese of Southwark wrapped his knuckles saying, there, there, don't talk to strangers. You can have your job back. Now it's been 12 weeks, and the bishop or the local leaders have not gone to Kurt and basically had uh, any sort of conversations. And what this is saying is that uh, they're not serious about safeguarding. They're serious about safeguarding jobs and creating flyers and pamphlets and PowerPoints and talking a good game. But actually, when it comes to doing something, they don't want to do it. And when people who do do things, like call the police, they're punishing them. The, the, my opinion is that the Church of England, this story, I encourage you to read it on Anglican Inc. to get the, the full details. This story just strikes me how appallingly awful the management culture of the Church of England is right now. Yeah. Uh, All right. This now, is the sort of thing that would cause Martin Luther to nail some stuff on a cathedral door somewhere. Yes. Um, it's that bad. All right. So we have a couple more stories, but we're really running out of time. We're going to hit 50 minutes here in a second. Let's do the Welby Goes to Rome story, and we'll save the Bishop Jamaica story for next week. All right. Justin. Justin Welby is uh, on his Roman holiday, and it's it's funny, we're seeing sort of a crossing of uh, lines. Welby's off to Rome, and Francis is on his Episcopal trajectory even further. Uh, he, uh, they went to uh, talk up this uh, COP26, this climate conference, all, issue all sorts of climate change things, and uh, all this hoo-ha about that. Um, Welby had a little uh, little show of the ring given by Pope Paul the Sixth to his predecessor. I forget which one. Uh, <laughs> so he's many. showing off his papal <laughs> ring. Uh -huh. uh, Justin, I've got to tell you, you, a man does not hold a ring out like you're a woman holding out an engagement ring. There's a different way to hold your hand. Uh, but hey, that's just me. Well, uh, I mean, there that's was... serious criticism, folks. Serious intellectual criticism. <laughs> But he doesn't hold his hand the right way. Yeah. And that's scripted. We, we notice everything. I mean, there was criticism last week of, you know, the Pope not being Roman Catholic enough. There's criticism this week about, you know, Archbishop Welby is probably more Roman Catholic than the Pope at times. Pope Francis clearly uh, demonstrates his love for Anglicanism in the way he demonstrates his Roman Catholicism. So it, these two deserve each other, if you ask me. So I, I'm glad when they get together, um, I, I, you know, their style and 
their ethos is a little different than mine, George. All right, have we hit? We, now, we've gone long. George and I talked a lot about the vaccine story early on. There's some stories we'll save for next Tuesday when we get together. Uh, we just have to. I can't. I can't keep you guys here for an hour. I, I know you. Some of you no no keep going. We can't. We can't. And George, you have. Uh, there's an orphanage, orphanage being reopened, and we got to get, get to that in half an hour too. So we got to go. All right. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 690 of Anglican Unscripted.